We've all walked tombward, like Mary, on a morning of defeat or despair or deep grief. Pick up the daily paper. Evidence that evil is growing, death reigns, and sin is triumphant is splashed across the front page. Now, it's not the newspaper's fault. It's just life. Defeat, despair, and deep grief are all around us, and yes, even within us. I recall walking into the hospital in North Carolina years ago and encountering a fellow pastor. We exchanged greetings, and I asked why he was there. He shared a tale of a member of his church battling serious illness. In responding to his queries, I spoke of a beloved grandmother in my congregation slowly dying of cancer. He sighed and said, every family has some kind of heartache or tragedy that they have to battle. I concurred. In the joy of Easter morning, we must start where the biblical story does, with a journey to the tomb. We all know what it is like to walk that road with Mary. It is as ancient as the first Easter and as contemporary as today. The reality of defeat, despair, and grief are as near as the loss of loved ones in accidents, the heartache of a child gone astray, the sinking feeling of not quite ever measuring up, and the deep grief of death. The reality of such a tombward journey is as global as the tragic loss of life this past year due to the COVID-19 pandemic from conflict or a hurricane hitting the shore. Mary's journey that morning is our journey on many a morning. In life's all too common journeys, we encounter small signs of a great victory. Now those signs were there on that first Easter. The Bible says Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. She does not understand its meaning. She runs to get the others. She jumps immediately to the common supposition that they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Whatever else is to be said, at this point it is clear that the grave is not the end. I remember a colleague telling of pausing in a cemetery after he had finished a funeral. He looked at a massive stone crypt set near where he had just concluded the service. Clear, specific instructions had been left. Not to be opened under any circumstance was chiseled on the stone door facing of that crypt. And yet there it was. The tiny shoot of a plant, possibly a tree in the making, had slowly but inexorably forced the door of the crypt open. A shaft of light was streaming in. So it is for us this day. A shaft of light breaks through the darkness. Mary struggles to believe. So too do Peter and the other disciple as they peer in to examine what is left behind. They examine the grave like befuddled detectives. One starting to believe, the other, Peter, clearly not knowing what to make of the empty tomb. We are so like them at times, it is painful. We believe and yet we are overwhelmed in grief and loss. We believe and yet we shake our heads at how awful the world is. We believe and yet we are still not so sure. We believe and see small signs of a great victory. Notice what the disciples and Mary did. They relegated the extraordinary, the stone rolled away and the tomb empty to the ordinary. They sought to explain it all with a simple supposition. The body has been taken. All the while, they confronted massive evidence of the truth. Christ has been raised from the dead. Death and sin are conquered. Belief dawns slowly with the light. The Bible says, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. This too is our struggle. Small signs of this colossal victory are all around us. Mary and the two disciples of that first Easter morning would teach us to look for signs of the extraordinary in the ordinary, in love shared, in care given, with hope amid despair, and laughter in the place of grief comes the dawning of belief. One of the followers gets it. The other disciple comes, and who, the one who reaches the tomb first, he also went in and he saw and believed. Let that be us. Begin to see the extraordinary, 
God in resurrection action amid the ordinary. In a scene that could have been taken from any cemetery, Mary encounters the triumphant Jesus. It is so ordinary that she at first doesn't even recognize him. She thinks Jesus is the gardener. Now it is important for us to pause and catch the full impact of what is being said. Jesus is first encountered near the tomb. Angels are inside the tomb at the very epicenter of defeat, proclaiming the triumph. We encounter Jesus first, often best, at the place of our defeat, despair, and deep grief, where we struggle to believe God is most present. When we have come to the end of our resources, there God breaks through in triumph. Focused on her grief, Mary teeters on the edge of faith. Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Then the full impact of the gospel hits. Jesus says to her, Mary, in the naming, she is claimed by the Lord. Christ's triumph becomes her destiny. Our morning begins in a graveyard and it ends in a shout, I have seen the Lord. Our path of faith is similar. Near the tombs of our life, be they physical or symbolic, we are named and claimed by the risen Lord. Lift your head when defeat, despair, and deep grief settle in. Look for the triumph of Christ. It is at hand. You are named and claimed. Death is defeated. Oh, to be sure, death is real. Jesus wept by a grave, and so should we. Our grief is a sign of our love, but it is not the end. The story is not finished. Though the, through the triumph of Christ, in life and death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. The Lord names you and claims you this day. Sin is conquered. Oh, to be sure, sin is still with us. We know the pain of its wounds too well, but it does not have the final word over your life or mine. Sin remains, but it no longer reigns. However scarred and marred your past, the triumphant Lord of the resurrection offers new life for you this day. In triumph, you are named and claimed. Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, once said that he was thinking of mounting a sign in front of his house. The old Martin Luther is dead. Now Jesus Christ lives here. That's what it's like to meet the risen Lord. The old half-dead person moves out, and the abundant life of Christ moves in. Empty life versus abundant life. So what does that look like? The old empty life is Mary Magdalene trudging to the tomb with tears in her eyes. The new life is Mary Magdalene running, sprinting away from the tomb with fire in her heart and good news on her lips. Or maybe resurrection life looks like Yeretsani Kamangeni, a Christian elder in troubled Mozambique. In hardships and upheavals, Yeretsani and his wife have buried 10 of their 13 children. Twice they have fled their home, left behind what they could not carry, and escaped to a refugee camp in Malawi. But if you met Yeretsani, you wouldn't guess how often death has touched him because the man bubbles over with resurrection life. It shows in the way he laughs and sings joyful African hymns. It shows in the way he shares his faith, telling others about the wonderful goodness of Jesus. It shows in the churches he has helped to build. It shows when he stands up in a congregation and glorifies God for strength to meet each day. The resurrection life looks like Yeret Sani Kamangini, a man who is grown strong in the broken places, a man who has been named and claimed by Jesus Christ. The old life is a widow, bereaved and alone, leaning over the coffin to touch a beloved face one last time. The new life is that same woman turning away from the coffin, and I hear her whisper, I'll see you in the morning, darling. I'll see you in the morning. Resurrection life sees further than the grave. The old life is a 13-year-old street kid in Zimbabwe, in the city of Harare. Like many homeless children, Tikaona lives by his wits. 
His parents are dead. He's heading for a life of crime, drugs, and prostitution. Sometimes he takes shelter with a Christian street ministry, but he usually gets in trouble there because he won't follow the rules and he's very violent, constantly beating up the smaller boys. But then he gets sick. And that is kind of a grace for Tikahona. In the hospital, he gets scared. He drops the tough guy pose and he meets Nancy Warlick, a Presbyterian mission coworker. Nancy has long talks with Tikahona and she gives him a Bible which he reads every day. Tikahona is released from the hospital. He gets back into school and goes to live on a farm, a home for homeless kids outside the city. Tikahona tells Nancy that when he grows up, he wants to be a minister. The old life is a college student named Jim. Jim is in his early 20s and he is rapidly going blind. Jim is a Christian and he wants to make the best of things, so while he still has some sight left, he volunteers in a rehabilitation center for kids with disabilities. One young boy in a wheelchair especially touches him. Jim tries to teach him to tie his shoes, to bathe himself, and to brush his own teeth, but over and over again the boy says, it's too hard, I just can't do it. And Jim says over and over, it's not too hard for you. You can do it. But meanwhile, Jim has problems of his own. His eyesight is getting worse. He can scarcely read a textbook now. He decides to withdraw from college, and he goes to the rehab center to tell them that he won't be able to do volunteer work anymore. The director asks him why, and Jim says, it's becoming just too much for me. I just can't do it anymore. And at that moment, Jim hears a familiar voice at his elbow. He looks down and there's the boy in the wheelchair looking up at him. And he hears this voice saying, it's not too hard for you, Jim. You can do it. And at the age of 29, Jim graduated from college. And on the very day of Jim's commencement, a little boy in a wheelchair tied his shoes by himself for the very first time. Resurrection life is not just preacher talk about pie in the sky. It is a tangible reality. It is the difference between who we were and who we are, and between who we are and who we are going to be. New life in Christ is courage for the struggle, faith to face the darkness, hope in death, joy in despair, comfort in loneliness, release from guilt, deliverance from shame. Hagia Sophia is a breathtaking structure in Istanbul. It was built as a Christian church. When Muslims took over Turkey, the church was turned into a mosque, and all the Christian art and symbols were plastered over. The Hagia Sophia was a museum of sorts until 2020. It has been restored to its original Christian architecture now. It turns out that the plaster and whitewash provided wonderful protection for all those Christian paintings and murals. Preacher George Buttrick tells a story about the days when Hagia Sophia was still a mosque, before it was restored. One day a visitor in the mosque was looking up at the great domed ceiling, showing faintly through the white paint was a picture of the victorious Christ, risen from the grave, arms outstretched in blessing. And the tourist, a Christian, cried out, You can't blot him out. He's coming back. Jesus is always coming back. He comes back from the dead. He comes back to the grieving and the heartbroken. He comes back to the tired and the burdened, the frightened and the lost. He even comes back to those who have not thought of him or called his name in a long, empty time. He comes to you. He comes to me, and when he comes, he names you and claims you, and things change. Our possibilities change, we change. To God be the glory, for Christ is risen. He has risen indeed. Alleluia. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, I could talk a great deal more about what new life looks like in others, but it's your turn now. I don't know what type of tomb journey you are experiencing currently. 
grief, loss, addiction, loneliness, pain, sickness. Consider what your new life, your abundant life, might look like. Decide if that's what you want. And if it is, come away from the tomb and walk with the risen Lord while his resurrection life just fills you up. For he is calling your name and is ready to claim you and love you no matter what you have done or what you have not done. Know also that you are welcome here. All, all are welcome here. Know that I would love to hear your story. If you have questions of faith like the disciples who first encountered the stone that was rolled away, or a prayer request, or maybe you would like more information about how to join this community of faith, know that I would welcome your phone call, text, or email. We have a special Discover First United program on Zoom next Sunday, April 11th at 7 p.m. for those who might be interested in church membership or becoming an official friend of the church. Please contact me or the church office to sign up. And now, friends, let us continue to worship the risen Lord as we sing our hymn of response.